Good evening, everyone. My name is Lan Richard. I am uh, one of the co-directors of a nonprofit called the Eco Justice Collaborative in Champaign. And in, on behalf of Eco Justice Collaborative, I want to welcome you all tonight. Uh, I was reminded that uh, on this pleasant night, there are many places that uh, you could have been, and you chose to be here. So we're very pleased about that. Uh, also want to give a special thank you to Channing Murray Foundation for hosting us, to providing the space and, and being so integral to, uh, to getting uh, publicity out, providing some food, etc. Uh, this is a, a wonderful place to gather and we hope we can do more of this. Uh, also our co-sponsors, the Social Action Committee from the Unitarian Universalist Church of Urbana-Champaign, uh, AWARE, anti-war, anti-racism effort, McKinley Church and Foundation, Champaign-Urbana Friends Meeting, Central Illinois Jobs with Justice, and the University of YMCA, all of whom helped with publicity in his design. And Wesley Methodist Church. Okay. Um, in putting together our, our event this evening, we had essentially three objectives. One, of course, is to bring uh, one of the uh, most outstanding voices of peacemaking and, uh, to, to Champaign again. Uh, I think uh, Kathy has been here uh, in the past, at least a couple of years ago, but we thought it was time to uh, bring her back. Uh, secondly, we wanted to find ways, if we can, uh, during this weekend to uh, provide support and synergy with the many uh, projects, campaigns, and good things that Voices for Creative Nonviolence is doing. So how can we in Champaign, as our organizations are working for social justice, uh, begin to, to, to team with or support or uh, hold up Kathy's work? And thirdly, very important, uh, we see this as a way to provide financial support. So, um, as you walked in, you may have missed, there's a little box over there on the table, and we are asking everyone to uh, give some serious consideration to making a don donation, no matter how small or large it could be, uh, please help support the work of Voices for Creative Nonviolence. It's a free will offering, but, uh, but uh, that's one of the primary reasons we're here tonight. Voices, as many of you know, is committed to, a strategic, uh, to strategic campaigns that uh, employ active nonviolent measures to challenge the economic and military violence within the world. Uh, much of it is perpetrated by our own government and much of it falls on very innocent uh, victims. From opposing uh, mass incarceration, uh, isolation, and solitary confinement in American prisons, closing, pushing for the closing of Guantanamo uh, prison, uh, from being on the ground literally during shock and awe uh, during the U.S. invasion of Iraq, calling for the closure of, of, uh, of uh, or withdrawal from Iraq, supporting the work of Afghan youth peace volunteers, and I hope we hear a little bit about that tonight. Uh, also working with street kids in Afghanistan and the Duvet Project, providing not, not only economic uh, opportunities, but also the real practical warm uh, quilts and blankets for people, uh, poor people in Afghanistan to through the, work through the winter. Um, Kelly, Kathy Kelly and Voices for Creative Nonviolence have uh, walked in places of great conflict and violence, uh, done so with great courage. They've stood in solidarity with, pieces, with people who are most oppressed, the people who are innocent victims of uh, this economic and military violence, and spoken truth to power uh, in ways that um, take great courage and only uh, a handful of folks in the world are able to do. And we need to provide support for those folks. Uh, and that is why it's my pleasure this evening to introduce tonight's speaker, 
Kathy Kelly. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you to all of you. I'm certainly pleased to be at Channing Murray again and to have heard all of the groups listed that have helped draw us together tonight. It's good to see Paul here. Um, I want to just make sure everyone can hear me. Does this sound okay back there? And I hope the high school study teacher's voice doesn't drown you out in front. Um, and, and I'm just very, very grateful to reconnect with Lan and Pam. Chicago was very sorry to say goodbye to those two, as you can imagine. Um, and I, I wish the Eco Justice Collaborative all good possibilities here. And, and also glad to meet Georgia, their host guest. So it's, it's been lovely to come down here. So on the Amtrak train on the way down, I helped myself to a Sarah Lee cinnamon roll, which I <laughs> don't do very often. But it just transported me right back to a setting 27 years ago in Lexington, Kentucky, when I was a prisoner in the Lexington prison maximum security. I taught in Catholic girls high school long enough before then that I kind of had a leg up on how to do it. But um, I don't have a lot that's good. In fact, I have nothing good to say about the Bureau of Prisons except that on a Saturday morning, they do give their inmates a big cinnamon roll, <laughs> if you get up early. Well, in the last prison I was locked up in, Michelle Obama had put the prisoners on a special diet, so the cinnamon rolls went out the window. <laughs> but. So that cinnamon roll um, took me back to being in the dining place in Lexington's prison with Lo Lorraine. And I had first met Lorraine in the Cass County Jail. Um, the reason I was in the Cass County Jail was because I had um, planted corn on top of nuclear missile silo sites. Intercontinental ballistic missiles were buried under the ground, 150 of them surrounding Kansas City and 1,000 in the Midwest, and I planted my pink pellets of corn on top of 14 of those, and for that I got nine months of maximum security prison. Um, well, actually one year, but the nine months in the prison, and otherwise I was in the Cass County Jail, which was a hellhole. The Cass County Jail, painted battleship gray, had um, three walls that were just prison bars. There was no privacy. There was a toilet right smack dab in the open. Uh, the shower had a torn blue shower curtain. No privacy. Um, it was always filled because Major Nick, who ran the Cass County Jail, could get $50 per head if he housed federal prisoners. So he was always trying to bring in more federal prisoners. Some people would be on the floor. And this is certainly true today in places across this country which are now like debtors' prisons um, as they're so filled up. Well, the Cass County Jail was a place um, where the food was terrible, you couldn't get cleaning supplies, uh, there was a miasmic cloud of smoke up at the ceiling because prisoners were back then allowed to smoke. It was unhealthy, the TV was blaring constantly. And um, it turned out that one day a woman came into the Cass County Jail with a, with a DUI and she was being held overnight, driving under the influence. And um, I tried to be helpful, Hannah, and you know, help her get straightened out. But as she was leaving the next morning, she had a newspaper. And I said, oh, do you think we could keep that newspaper? And she was so gracious. She said, oh, honey, that's yesterday's newspaper. Y'all ought to get today's newspaper. I'll have it sent right in to you. And I said, well, actually, um, we, we'd like that newspaper because we're running out of toilet paper. And when we... So she gets out of the prison and slapped a lawsuit on the Cass County Jail because they didn't do the basics like give the prisoners toilet paper, which was true, they didn't. So in came Major Nick, who um, always looked like he was right out of central casting. He had a kind, he was portly, he had a big belly and he'd wear a Hawaiian shirt and he couldn't button the bottom three buttons and his um, balded head was covered with some slicked back strands of hair and he always kind of wanted to wash his glasses for him and his, his only sound was full blast volume and he came into that what they called um, the bullpen, 
furious, wanting to know which one of you all bitches had the nerve to say that we do not give you toilet paper. <laughs> and one of the women, I think, trying to sort of make a joke, said, must have been missiles. They, they would call me missiles for short. <laughs> she thinks she's in some kind of hotel. And um, so then Major Nick polled every person in the Cass County Jail bullpen. Have you ever had the experience in this here bullpen when we did not give you everything you need? And every woman said, oh yes, Major Nick, you take good care of us. That's right, Major Nick, you give us, and I was stunned. So when he got to me, by that time, my Irish temper was kind of up, and I said, you don't give us toilet paper for cleaning supplies. The food is slop. You take money for each one of us. We haven't been outside for two months. You shouldn't be running a kennel for dogs, much less a place where people live. And I'm waiting for everybody to say, yeah. And the women were sorting their socks and reading their scriptures. Oh, what the world is this? So finally, at the Lexington Maximum Security Prison, over a cinnamon roll and coffee, I worked up the courage to ask Lorraine, my fellow prisoner who'd been in the Cass County Jail with me, what was going on that morning? And she looked at me as though she really couldn't believe anybody could be that dense. And as soon as she started answering me, I got it. She said, Missiles, honey, you didn't have anything to lose. Any woman in the Cass County Jail that sassed Major Nick could have lost her good time, her chance to see her kids before she got shipped clear across the country, a chance to talk with a chaplain, a chance to talk with her lawyer, a chance to get some commissary so she could fix herself up before she went in front of a jury. Some of those women weren't literate, you know that, Missiles. She needed to see that chaplain so she could read what the charges were against her. And I was just flooded with um, embarrassment that I hadn't figured that out for myself. And so educating Kathy has happened that way again and again, but I'm very, very grateful to Lorraine for that moment. And I wrote that up in a, in a book that I wrote, um, half of which was about the US prison system. And when I was more recently in prison in Lexington, uh, which is now a minimum security prison for women, the, the men are in the maximum security. Um, somebody sent the book in to me, so I put it in the library and it started to move around the prison. And TJ, one of the younger prisoners, read it. And she came to me and she said, I sobbed and sobbed last night. I cried for so long. And the reason TJ cried was because, as she put it, I wasn't even born when you were writing that, and nothing's changed. Well, the truth is, things have changed, they've gotten worse. The United States now has 2.2 million people in our prison industrial complex. Recently, I and others walked from Chicago to the Thompson prison. Um, it took us 15 days to walk there. Uh, we were 12 people upon arrival, and uh, it was just amazing. There were 18 squad cars and flying airborne vehicles overhead. And, and the prison is not quite open yet, but it's going to house 1,900 people in the kind of maximum security which allows somebody outside of their room for only one hour a day. And people could be there for years and years and years. So many people in the system now plead guilty because if you don't plead guilty on a narcotics charge, statistically, if you take it to trial, your sentencing will be at least four times higher than what you would have gotten if you just took the plea. And so I can talk about a world of imprisoned beauty, every prison I've ever been in. But just as Ann Jones writes, war isn't over when it's over, these imprisonments aren't over when they're over because the repercussions, the reverberations, the after effects affect communities, create greater likelihood of poverty, separate families, lower self-esteem, make it so difficult for people to find jobs. And so now here we are today reeling from the news of the week, from uh, the story of Anton killed in Louisiana, 
from the story of Philando killed in Franklin Grove near Minneapolis and then the five police people killed in Dallas. And I'm sure all of us are wondering, where is this country going? And I think it's pretty clear that militarism and getting weapons and using threat and using force has been increasingly getting the upper hand in our communities locally and certainly in our foreign policy internationally. Basing our policies on threat and force on acquiring weapons, on developing, selling, storing weapons, and increasingly, even in the police departments, using those weapons, witness the robot that was used to explode the place where the person who was the sniper that attacked the Dallas police was, was crouching and, and quite possibly could have been arrested and questioned and brought through due process. So I'd like to, to ask you to think with me a little bit further about the ways in which that militarism has played out, particularly in Afghanistan. And um, for me, one lens of late has been to, to think hard about the story of Khaled Ahmed. Khaled Ahmed is a pharmacist. He was studying at the Kunduz Hospital. And his mother had said to him, because there was so much fighting going on in Kunduz in the northern province of Afghanistan, son, stay home. Don't go to your job today. It's too dangerous. But he said to his mother, I'm really, really needed there now. Um, there, there are so many people that are being treated just the previous week because of the fighting. The hospital had treated 359 people, 50 of them children and they needed pharmacists to be there for all of that treatment. And so he convinced his mother he would be safe. You know, the hospital has a place for us to stay um, underground and no one's going to bomb a hospital. And so at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, 2.05 to be exact, he and the head pharmacist who were on their turn to sleep while others were above ground were awakened by a terrible crash. Uh, they didn't know what it was. They went racing upstairs. The hospital was in flames. There was smoke everywhere. And patients whom they had recently treated were burning in their own beds. And they realized that somehow it was happening. The hospital was being bombed aerially. And so they decided to try and make a run for it to the security post. And they got there and security people said, quick, open up your cell phones, take out the battery, take out the SIM card, whatever technology the Americans have, because people knew the Taliban couldn't be bombing them aerially. The Afghan government didn't have the wherewithal. It must be NATO or the US. And they were told, take their cell phones apart because they could use the technology to trace somebody using a kind of a, a, a sensory imaging and, and heat sensors. And so they took apart their cell phones and the security people said, well, if we make a run for it to the entrance one by one, we might be able to save ourselves. So the head pharmacist ran for it and he made it. And then it was Khalid's turn to run. And he got as far as the gate. He had one foot outside the gate and he took shrapnel in his back and he fell to the ground. He was bleeding profusely. He managed to roll himself into a ditch, and he was sure that he was dying because he was starting to lose consciousness. And he remembered that in his tradition, if you know that you're approaching death, try to contact your father and tell your father you're sorry for anything you ever did in your life to harm him or your family. But he had taken his own cell phone apart. And so Khaled, with only one arm working, the other arm was already paralyzed, managed to go inside his book bag, pull out the cell phone, take it apart, put the SIM card and the battery back in, dial his home, and he reached his mother. And of course, his mother <laughs> wants to know, my son, how are you? Tell me what's happened. Something's wrong. And he kept trying to say faintly, mom, put dad on the phone. The mother remonstrated with him, wanting to hear, where are you, what's wrong? Mom, I have to talk to dad. And then he told his father what happened. His father managed to get from him exactly where he was, near the entrance, in a ditch. And the father had relatives who lived very near the Kunduz hospital. They raced there, they found 
Ahmed, Khaled Ahmed, and they wrapped him up. They put him in a vehicle. They took him to the nearest clinic. The people at the clinic said, we can't help him. He's too seriously injured. Try Pule Khomri. So that was about a two-hour ride to get there. And there they said the same thing. He needs surgery. We can't help him. Three hours further to get to Kabul, he got to the Italian, um, we call them the Emergency Surgical Centers for Victims of War. Like Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, these hospitals never ask any questions. They'll stitch up anybody, and they are, are extremely skilled in surgery, and they saved his life. So I was visiting at that hospital. I have O negative blood, so they're always happy to see me um, to donate blood. And I asked, is there anybody who survived the bombing of the Doctors Without Borders Hospital in Kunduz who is a patient here? And that's how I met Khaled Ahmed and heard his story. And at the end of that story, he asked me, because he realized I was from the United States. His question was, why did they want to hurt us? We were only trying to help people. Why did they want to hurt us? We were only trying to help people. And that's not quite the end in my own estimation of discussion about the bombing of the Kunduz Hospital. A report that the United States government finally put out um, did say, and I think this is important, that it was a disproportionate response to a non-existent threat. Well, that describes every war the United States has been in all these wars of choice. Um, but uh, there's a group called the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan um, Reconstruction that four times a year submits a report to the US Congress. And this it's called the SIGAR report. And the person in charge of SIGAR, John Sopko, S-O-P-K-O, is really an extraordinary investigator. He, he's almost like a little pit bull. Once he gets hold of an issue, he will research it. And he has pointed out many, many, many instances of corruption, ways in which United States money goes into the hands of the Taliban because of this kind of rope-a-dope scheme with trucking that the Taliban used to um, uh, squeeze money out of US spaces. He's, he's followed many, many stories. But there were 614 hospitals and, and, and well, healthcare delivery uh, facilities claiming aid, assistance from USAID. And John Sapko realized that in many of those places, the areas were too violent for anyone to go and visit and do some oversight. They were too violent because right now, the Taliban and other warlords control over 70% of Afghanistan. They control more of Afghanistan than the Taliban controlled when the United States invaded in 2001. All these many years of United States troops in Afghanistan, so many people think, oh, well, we have to be there to support the people and protect them from the Taliban. It turns out we've helped the Taliban grow stronger. And there are many places where Westerners can't even drive along a roadside to find out how are things going there. So John Sopko um, began to investigate some of the coordinates for the facilities that were requesting USAID assistance. And it turned out five of them were in Tajikistan, the country to the north of Afghanistan. Five were located in Pakistan, next door. One was in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And so John Sapko started to think, well, this really takes a lot more investigation. So he got a crew of people to examine the coordinates for each one of these so-called healthcare facilities. Half of them were in questionable locales. And of that half, um, there were 90 for which uh, there was no building within 400 yards of the coordinate. In other words, in John Sopko's words, these were ghost hospitals. So there really is a hospital run by Doctors Without Borders that had served 359 people in a given week, desperately needed, the only hospital in the region. That's why Khaled Ahmed had to go to two other places and finally all the way to Kabul. The only hospital gets turned into smithereens, rubble, ashes, 42 people killed, three of them doctors, 
12 in all were staff. It can't be replaced easily. And the United States is meanwhile increasing the corruption by funding hundreds of ghost facilities. NPR did a similar report about ghost schools in Afghanistan. And you can also read reports about ghost police, ghost uh, militaries. $104 billion more than was spent on the Marshall Plan has been spent on non-military assistance to Afghanistan. When I'm there in the wintertime, it is so cold. There's electricity every other day, maybe. You can never drink the water that comes out of the tap. The Kabul River is so polluted that the stench is overpowering. We stay in a place right off the river. You just almost have to hold your breath to fall asleep at night. Um, the education is a, a shambles. Uh, it is now 17% literacy for girls and women, 37% if you count the men in. Um, the the health care delivery is disastrous. Where did all this money go? How is it that Afghanistan now ties, well, last year it tied with North Korea and Somalia as the most corrupt country in the world. This year it came in second. So I'm fortunate. I am very, very, very privileged along with my companions to have gotten to know a group of young people who in spite of all of what I've said have become my most idealistic mentors. You know, I taught high school forever in Chicago and I never thought a group of 15 year olds would become my main mentors and when I'm in my 60s. But they are truly an amazing group of youngsters and they, they won't buckle. It seems to me they're going to try their best, even though their own family members are saying, look, you're studying in Kabul so that um, someday you're going to get a job, right? And they have no idea if they're going to get a job or not. Um, they. Uh, are studying in Kabul and that means that somebody else in the family, maybe their mother, maybe their father has to go out at two o'clock in the morning and go to try to fetch fuel, kind of tumbleweed and wrestle it out of the mountainside and bring it back and somebody else has to go and fetch water and somebody else has to work the hard labor of the farming. And so it's very important to their families that they become success stories. And they're nervous about that. They're anxious about that because the schooling is so corrupt that if you really want to make sure you get a degree, you pay money for it. But nevertheless, they've been doing a lot of self-education. Um, their border free center is simply thriving and they know a lot now about the world through Skype phone calls, through um, seminars that they themselves now teach. It's, it's just remarkable to me. They've been doing very, very wonderful things and they have gone to visit Khaled Ahmed at the emergency hospital and tried themselves to understand an answer to Khaled's question. Why would you want to bomb us? We were only trying to help people. Um, there are some stories that uh, I find maybe for my own emotional well-being I need to forget for a while and then they come back. And there's one such story like that which I'd like to tell you tonight. I'm, I'm very close to a particular family, um, three of whom live in Kabul um, and they're from the province of Bamiyan. And there was a night when they were, uh, the, the, the widow and her five children were trying to sleep through a very, very cold night and um, one of the brothers woke up and he was just shivering. He was thinking he'd turn into an icicle, you know, when you're waiting maybe outside for public transportation and your toes have frozen. And he saw his other brother sleeping soundly and he thought, if I just take my brother's blanket long enough to warm myself up, uh, maybe he won't even notice it. Well, uh, the other brother noticed it and realized that if he didn't get his blanket back, he might die overnight of hypothermia. And so there ensued a struggle over the one blanket. And the two brothers fought and the fight escalated and it just became a fight that wouldn't end until it looked to other family members looking on in horror as the one brother might suffocate the other with the blanket. And then finally the family members pulled them apart. Well, those brothers today are part and parcel of an effort that has begun every winter for the past four winters in which 
like young social workers, the young people fan out and they go up the mountainside and they go into the refugee camps and they try to find 20 Peshto women, 20 Tajik women, and 20 Hazara women to form a team, an inter-ethnic team of 60 women who can feed their families because they'll be able to sew big, heavy blankets. Even I now kind of know how to do it. You, you get the wool and you, you, first you sew up the coverlet and then you shove the wool into the coverlet and then you sew it up and then you get a baseball bat and you beat it. That's at that point I passed out actually, but um, it's, it's, it's quite a process. And um, the women make those heavy dubets and then the young people give them away for free to some of the neediest families. It's a good project, they call it the Duvet Project. And it takes a lot of work, you, know, you have to get the storage room and the drivers and the, the trucks and the women and make sure everything is accounted for very, 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 very carefully. But it's, it, they, they work it so well now that some of the street kids who hang out are actually helping to run the project. Um, I, I greatly admire them for this. And I would like to offer one more story that comes from um, the young people that I feel so close to myself. Nobody should be out running in Kabul early in the morning. It's just this smog-covered city. The air is horrible. It's got the highest content of fecal matter in the air of almost anywhere in the world. Ah, do not run in Kabul. But, you know, young boys like to be fit and trim and see if the girls will notice. And so my young friend goes out for a run fairly often, Abdul Hai. And one morning, he was out running, and he heard a woman begging. And he slowed his pace, and he thought, that's Habib's grandmother. Now, Habib is a young boy who um, has work on the street, sometimes washing cars, but often with his younger brother, hand in hand, moving through the marketplace, carrying a scale and someone will tap him and he'll put the scale on the ground and the person stands on the scale, weighs himself, gives a pittance to Habib, and Habib just keeps on going through the marketplace and through the streets until he can bring home enough money to at least buy some bread for the family. And home is a series of poles and plastic tarps, no walls. I, I cannot imagine how they make it through the winter. And so to augment Habib's income, the grandmother goes out to beg under her steel blue burqa. And Abdul Hai recognized the voice. So he stopped and he said, Salam, Subhan. And he began to talk with the woman. You're Habib's grandmother, aren't you? I'm Abdul Hai. And she then um, thanked him profusely and realized that he was seeing the person behind the burqa. He was much more taken by relationship than by the idea that you know he might be better than her because he didn't have to beg. And I think that that teaches me a great deal, to try to see the person, not a monolithic category of the people of Afghanistan or the people of Iraq or the people of Syria, but always try to go for the recognition of persons, personhood, possibility of relationship. I know that language and geography make it difficult for us to do this, but um, to constantly try to recognize our shared humanity. Um, I recently came back from having been in Russia, and this is all very, very, very new for me. Uh, but I went to St. Petersburg, formerly Leningrad, and learned there that one of the things that broke the siege of Leningrad were seeds. Seeds helped to break the siege because people planted those seeds and the next year they had food to survive. Those who survived that brutal, horrible first year had a chance. And yet at the same time, the people who were responsible for cultivating and keeping the heritage seeds of the area, even though they were desperately needed, kept that set of seeds intact. And so I was thinking a great deal about the planting as I walked through a memorial that was lined with you know, wine red roses and wildflowers called All Heal, and thinking of the many, many people who didn't survive 
the siege of Leningrad and the importance of seeds. And my friend Hakim, who is the mentor for the Afghan peace volunteers and who also came on this trip, um, tapped me on the shoulder and he said, you know, when the Afghan peace volunteers begin their permaculture class, they always begin it with the story about the importance of planting seeds and they tell about the siege of Leningrad. So I want to close by thanking all of you. Thank you for the seeds you've planted, you've watered, you've helped to grow communally, literally, figuratively. Thank you for planting seeds of peace. I wonder if you might know a song, inch by inch, row by row. Inch by inch, row by row. Gonna make this garden grow. All I need is a rake and a hoe and a <laughs> and a piece of level ground. By inch, row by row. Comes tumbling down. Can we do that last one again? Inch by inch, row by row. Sorry, we sang this every night of the walk to Thompson and I blanked on the last two lines. Anyway, that idea of making the seeds um, possible for future generations, I think is, is part of where we're going in our, um, in our vocation, if you will. And, and I think about planting those six pellets of pink corn on intercontinental ballistic missile silo sites and feel very, very grateful for that opportunity. So wherever we can, plant those seeds of peace, seeds of peace that can give a future to future generations unburdened by the terrible, terrible, ruthless and reckless weaponry that's also unfortunately even been planted in our ground, in our seas, and now in our skies. Um, it will, I believe, make for the generations to come uh, reason to remember those who helped us survive a time of siege. Thank you very much. Oh, I'll give you anything you want to cut that song part. <laughs> If you have questions for Kathy, uh, we want to take a few minutes. For a few yeah, there might be another microphone here, too, is there? Uh, that one there, I guess. Yeah. This one may work out. All right, good. So, um, questions, comments, ideas, most welcome. Well, we just <laughs> You mentioned the territory in Afghanistan. I have questions about Russia and Ray, Ray McGovern, wonderful man. But um, the territory that the U.S. does control, is that where the lithium is, the Chinese copper mine? I don't want to be a, you don't know. Yeah. No, um, it's not. I mean, I think that uh, the Hindu, underneath the Hindu Kush mountains are the kinds of things we put in our cell phones and uh, rare earth minerals, very, very valuable minerals, but um, right now um, the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline that was supposed to be designed to carry natural gas, that, that's gotten no place. Unical tried to start that um, back in the 90s and wasn't able to do it. Um, the, the mining efforts that the Chinese have started up in the Ainak area are a little bit dependent on this warlord named Dostum saying, I I'm in, yeah, right, and he's a very, very, he's the fellow who had taken many, many Taliban prisoners, put them in sealed train cars, and then they, they suffocated to death. Um, so he's, he's, he's a pretty ruthless guy. Are there future prospects in mind, and is that why the United States troops are remaining? Um, I'm not sure, but I, I do think also, Paul, along with control of resources, the United States is very interested in being able to say to China and Russia, um, we have bases, we have military strength, 
and we're not going anywhere. So I think they have wanted to keep um, basing in Afghanistan, and certainly uh, when you see the, the, the way the United States has ringed itself around China, they want that necklace, if you will, to persist. Thank you. Uh, well, there is a very well-known landmark um, that looks almost identical to buildings that I saw as bread silos in um, parts of, of uh, Yalta in this recent trip. Um, so that's, it's, it's, it's a building that isn't used for anything anymore, but it's definitely a landmark and it was a, 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 a big, huge building for storing um, bread that um, the Russians had built. Um, some people say that the Russians had more success in reconstruction while they were occupying Afghanistan than the United States has had. I, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. Um, by now, um, I think it would be fair to say that the United States presence in Afghanistan has prolonged the fighting with the Taliban um, to, to such an extent that, that more lives have been lost uh, at, due to the United States occupation. And of course, um, in the recent release of statistics about how many people have been killed by drone warfare, uh, they said 67 to 114, I believe, but that was only counting people in what they call areas that are not areas of hostility. So it didn't count Afghanistan, Syria, or Iraq. And it's very difficult to get any counts in any way of how many civilians have been killed in Afghanistan. Um, but in terms of starvation and disease and displacement, uh, right now the statistic for displacement caused by war is 800 to 1,000 people per day. So if you can imagine, internally, 800 to 1,000 people picking up and running to what, to where, to, you know, four poles and a tarp like Habib and his mother and grandmother and little brother, then people can't survive the, the, the harsh winters. They, they don't have enough food to get by. They don't build up immunities. And so it's, it's become a kind of a nightmarish situation. Um, when I... Um, tried to meet with a veteran of the Soviet war in Afghanistan. I, I was able to do that. I, I met with Konstantin, big, healthy, blustery grandfather. And um, I was very touched. He said, you know, all the money that's been spent on wars, it should be being spent on health care and discovering cures for diseases. And he had driven a truck for 10 years in Kabul. Uh, but he was uh, not at all enamored with warfare and, and didn't approve of war. And I kind of had the sense that um, the KGB and the Russian government knew what people would be saying if they were formally allowed to talk with us. Thank you. In Afghanistan? Well, 65% um, of the population are under 21 years of age. So one hope is that the warlords aren't going to live forever. And I include the United States in amongst the warlords. Um, so it could be that uh, a younger generation will say, we don't want to keep prolonging this fighting. Um, Okay, so the wildly optimistic thought would be that uh, in spite of the fact that every group that I'm aware of in Kabul itself, which is the bubble, has weapons, except my Afghan peace volunteer friends. I, I mean, I went to visit, I'll just say, I went to visit a group called Peaceful Tomorrows, and thinking I was sort of being empathetic, I said to the person in charge, 
well, it must be very difficult for you to be trying to work toward an agenda of peace when there's so many weapons coming into the city constantly. And he, he said, yeah, and our problem is we don't know how to train people to use them fit. So um, that said to me that many, many groups have weapons in Kabul today, and, and I've heard that, and um, even right next door to the Afghan Peace Volunteers now, there's a group that's carrying rifles and wearing a, a, a dress that looks like Pashto dress, and they're protected by the government. So, so I think it's not looking very good, but there was a recent demonstration that reached a million people and it was ostensibly because of a decision on the part of the Afghan government to reroute a, um, a conduit for electricity away from the Bamiyan area. And, and so the Hazaras, were, they took umbrage and they organized ostensibly about that. But most analysts said this was designed to be a show of strength and power. That, um, so they did, they showed that they had, you know, could, in short order, bring in by virtue of many, many busloads of people and um, getting the people in Kabul to go out, over a million people. And it was completely nonviolent. There wasn't, the, there were seven journalists that were beaten, I don't know why, but otherwise it was completely nonviolent. So that seemed to me to be a sign that maybe people, power could occasion significant change. I also think when you look at China, um, just looking at the situation of women in China. It wasn't so long ago that a Chinese woman would be subjected to concubinage and have her feet bound and not be taught to read. Now, women in China today don't have a perfect situation, but it does seem to me that, you know, you can identify spots in the world. In Russia, I mean, they've, they've been very resilient. They've made huge gains since World War II. Uh, in fact, you can see that all across Europe. So I, I wouldn't want to be a total pessimist. I'll just say one other thing. It's interesting to me that in Iraq, in Baghdad, where the suffering is just nightmarish, it's garish, it's horrible. But Muqtadar al-Sadr, who was the leader of the Sadr city, the Sadr brigade, he was a fighter, he retired from that. This is after the United States invasion and occupation and the Civil War. He went and studied in Iran. He's come back to Baghdad, and he now says that he believes in nonviolent tactics, and he organized a huge march into the green zone in Baghdad. And when they got there, they splashed in the fountains and lolled around on the green grasses as a way of saying, this is what basically the 1% oligarchs in Iraq have, and we are going to take it back for today. But it, they made their point, and no one was injured or killed at that during that demonstration. Um, it isn't that I want to so much say, you know, I must preach nonviolence to other people, or my point of view must be vindicated, but that the constant rounds of spiraling, killing, torture, disappearing, you know, it wears people out. It has to burn out at some point. And I, so I think if there could be alternative means because of a leadership that would um, take root, I'm not thinking of one person, but leadership that would take root, that would say, look, if the Western powers might want nothing better for them than for us to wear ourselves out killing each other. Why should we do that? That maybe there might be a, a more hopeful future for places like Afghanistan and Iraq. This is well beyond your question, but I also want to say that I don't think the United States can control what it has unleashed. The United States has unleashed chaos and mayhem and viciousness and brutality. I had lived in Baghdad before the 2003 shock and awe under economic sanctions, and it was horrible under economic sanctions, but nothing approached the fear and the terror that are present now. I don't think the United States can control it, nor have we any right to decide who should get the upper hand in the civil wars that have begun. It's not our business. I believe we should... I believe we should pay reparations for the suffering caused. 
but pay those reparations to reputable groups that have a track record of having avoided corruption. Now, that's not a long list, I know, but we, sh we should not entrust U.S. funds to groups like USAID and certainly not to the United States military. Thank you for those serious questions. I believe the United States waged an economic war against Iraq. Um, the war was waged in such a way as to directly target the most innocent people in that country, elderly people, sick people, and children. Um, I think the United States wanted to say to every other country all around the world, if you don't subordinate yourselves to serve our national interest, we can eliminate you. Witness Iraq. And I think with regard to Iraq's dictatorial, ruthless, brutal leader, the United States wanted to be able to say, get down on the ground, put your face in the dirt, eat the dirt. If you don't eat the dirt, we might kill you. And um, the I don't think Saddam Hussein necessarily missed a meal over the course of those economic sanctions, but it did mean that um, Saddam Hussein would not be a, any kind of a threat to neighboring countries. And I think the United States wrongfully had the idea that somehow, eventually, it might make of Iraq this kind of um, beacon of democracy. Well, they certainly haven't accomplished that goal, if that ever was honestly their goal. I think they changed the goalposts regularly. But I think we should look upon the time of economic sanctions as an economic war, a war that was waged against innocent people who had no means to um, protect themselves and certainly meant us no harm. It was a war of choice. So when we talk about the longest war in US history, a lot of people talk about Afghanistan. I think we really should reserve that title for Iraq because the United States armed both sides of the Iran-Iraq conflict. Um, Henry Kissinger said things couldn't be better. They're killing each other and using our weapons to do it. The United States then went on to impose economic sanctions for 13 years and then the invasion in 1991 that had ruined the electrical facilities all across that country and began some of the very, very serious problems with being able to get potable water. And then of course the 2003 shock and awe bombing and I was there, it was shocking and it was awful. Um, how good was the United States? How good were the European countries at stopping a war before it started. You were there in 2003. The world came closer to stopping a war than ever before. So close. I mean, think back. The weapons inspectors were within two weeks of plopping down on the United Nations leaders' desks their completed report. They had searched everywhere. And they were ready to say, we couldn't find the weapons of mass destruction. No can do, not there. And so George Bush, Tony Blair were in a panic. If we don't get this show on the road, we're not gonna be able to have our war in spite of all the planning we've already done. And so when the peace movement was out in force in city after city and country after country, it was a very unnerving for the leadership that wanted that war so badly. Imagine if the peace movement at that point had also had the inspiration, if you will, of let's say a combination of the Occupy movement and Tahrir Square. Imagine if the peace movement had sat down and said, sorry, we're not getting up. It's possible that this peace movement, which the New York Times referred to as the world's only other superpower, could have flexed a tremendous muscular preventive to a war that has now cost countless, countless lives. Well, it doesn't help us to beat ourselves up over the past. I, I have to tell myself that a lot. 
I think what helps is to catch courage from one another. And um, that's something we're pretty good at doing, but we could get even better. Um, to keep in our sights a very uh, realistic, logical, rational set of coordinates, if you will, for where we want to go. Of course our society is going to bombard us in terms of the corporate groups that are rooted in the military industrial complex and the prison industrial complex. I'm thinking of those who derive government salaries or corporate benefits. They're going to tell us that the most important thing you can do is have fun, <laughs> sports, entertainment, more sports, more entertainment, get out on the soccer field, get your kids out to the soccer field, have play days, be a kid with you. It's just endless, endless rounds of holiday celebrations and go shopping celebrations and mandatory gift giving and it keeps people breathless it keeps them so 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 busy they don't have time sometimes to read the newspaper so we have to be logical and recognize the world we really are moving into which is a world facing serious serious terrorizing terrifying realities of global warming and climate change. The greatest terror we face, the greatest terror we face, is the terror of what we're doing to our own environment. And so we have to gently but clearly con convey that to the next generation because they're going into that world. Not some other world, they're going into that world. And I think the, the Military industrial congressional media complex has a vice-like grip on education. And it's hard on, in the universities, it's hard to tell the truth when this program is funded by that defense spending company and that program involves this military grouping. I know people feel like I could lose my job. I think that's the other thing that hampers us a bit. People are convinced that jobs, jobs, jobs are the most important thing. But that's not, I and mean, given the, the crises we face, maybe that's not true. When I say catch courage from one another and you know, build communities where no one's going to be left out in the cold, and you know, that's what I see with the Afghan peace volunteers. I, I mean, they don't have a pop to piss in, basically, but they make sure that no one's going to be left out. Um, I, I'm not convinced that uh, the glory of having a job is more important than aligning one's life with one's deepest values. Um, but be careful. Uh, and, and of course, be careful of one another. So the, I sometimes um, start to shrink and shudder when I hear people say there is no peace movement. Um, because actually, if you were to put a little red dot on a white sheet with a map of the United States, just the United States, for every single group that's advocating or living out some kind of countercultural value system in their work and in their witness, Pretty soon, those red dots would be blending into each other, and you'd have a big, huge red um, stain, or a good stain, not a blood stain. And, and so I think there's a lot that's going on in this country, and it has everything to do with living simply, sharing resources, preferring service to dominance, and trying to create a world wherein it's easier to be good. I mean, you, you, you see it all the time, but you're not going to see it on the TV screen. And, and the corporate powers aren't going to want to present that as an ideal image. I think Paul has another question. Since you answered my first question about why we're in Afghanistan, Chinese, Russian encirclement, can you talk a little bit about what your discussions were like in Russia mm. with the idea of NATO encirclement and the uh -huh. absolutely belligerent 
things that are going on. In the, you know, anybody who's doing that in Mexico, they'd be nuked. So. We didn't meet a single Russian who said we want to go to war with the United States. Um, I think uh, many people felt a sort of a fatalism. They know their military is weak. They can't imagine that their government would declare war on the United States. They'd like to imagine the United States wouldn't declare war on them. Um, they're very aware of these two antagonistic arsenals that both have parity in terms of nuclear weapons. But um, what we heard again and again was that um, people in Russia want stability. They don't want another war. And going to war memorials in Sevastopol and in St. Petersburg, where the Siege of Leningrad Memorial is, I, it was a way that I learned it in a way I hadn't realized before um, how hideous the toll of war and dictatorship had been on Russian people. And I can believe, even though it's what Putin says, I still think it's true, he says the matrix in Russia is one in which people crave stability. Well, I, I mean, uh, that may be the party line, but I still think it's observably true that people want stability. And they've been beginning to get it. You know, you see these cities that are rebuilt that had only 10 buildings standing at the end of World War II. You see people looking healthy, out taking vacations on the Baltic seaports. You see transportation bullet trains that we would be so, so happy to see here in the United States. And we don't have a fraction of that kind of transportation. Um, uh, hydroponic cucumber factories and um, big, huge stadiums, a lot, lots of signs of, you know, things, it isn't the way I'd want to spend money, but it's, you, there are signs of investment. But the recession is hitting them quite hard right now, such that the prices of food are growing higher than the wage income that people have, and that's likely to get worse. And so people are cutting back on luxuries, and it may be that they'll have to start cutting back on food. Um, why is the United States imposing the sanctions and then pushing Putin to develop more defense establishment? Well, this is terrible. He's now trying to call up 400,000 internal National Guard type police. Some young people said they're not going to get 400,000. I don't know about that, but you know, you call up that number of militarized people and you have to give them guns and training. and this would be taking more away from a Russian economy that's struggling, struggling to help people just get by. So why the United States would do this? It's insane. You know, we ripped up the 19, well, George Bush ripped up the anti-ballistic missile treaty, walk, completely illegitimately walked away from that. NATO has been a history of missed opportunities to solve um, problems through diplomacy. I think the build up along the Russian border and now the installation of ongoing bases is just poking, provoking, pushing for a war with a nuclear armed state. I mean, this isn't like picking on Panama and Grenada. When we pick on China and Russia, we're picking on serious military powers. They're crazy. I'll say that again, they're crazy. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. And so, you know, I heard some people say, NATO is a senseless organization. Um, people are friendly to us to a fault. We never found ourselves um, being sneered at or um, objected to. We went many different places. I would say um, freedom of speech is limited in Russia today. Uh, I definitely had that impression. And I would imagine surveillance is quite strong. And, you know, I, I come at some situations conditioned by our experiences in Iraq where, you know, after a while you could kind of tell what the party line was if you were hearing the same thing in three different cities and it was said with almost the same inflection, um, then you thought mm, somebody's saying that because that's what they were told to say before we walked in the door. And that's, that's standard. But then you think about how a party line is kind of endorsed here in the United States because people hear it over and over and over again uh, in our social media even. So um, why is the United States pushing in this way? I, I find it inscrutable, except that I think the US wants to be the unipolar sole superpower and doesn't want any other countries 
uh, having say so when it comes to domination of world resources and decision making. But I don't think that's a feasible goal. I don't think that's a realistic goal. I think other countries are going to be assertive. And so my hope is that somehow uh, US people could themselves get a grip on, on the foreign policy and, and turn it away from this long and sordid history of being a foreign policy based on threat and force. I mean, 95% of our lives are organized around nonviolent ways of solving problems in our personal lives. Why should we have 100% of our foreign policy making be organized around threat and force? We have one more question back here. Well, we're very interested in these autonomous zones for reasons you can probably figure out. You know, if the Afghan peace volunteers could somehow set up an autonomous zone, that would be great. So we've asked people to go on behalf of Voices to Apartado in Colombia, and we're um, trying to get to Acteal, and maybe you have some contacts, but you know, in, in Chiapas, uh, the, the, not only are there the Zapatistas with an autonomous zone, but also a very impressive, sturdy group called the Bees, Las Abejas, living in Acteal. Um, and, and these are, I think, beacon-like examples of people who sustained loss of life, a lot of loss of life. Uh, 200 people were killed in the community in Colombia as they tried to say, we're not the government, we're not the fighting forces, we're, we're separate from that, but eventually they're, they're now celebrating their 19th year as a community. And um, they, they've, they've put uh, institutions in place, uh, education, uh, their own school, their, and their own um, sustainable practices for farming. And um, similarly with the Zapatistas, they've managed to get their own fuel, their own energy. Uh, I'm not saying it's been easier without loss of life, but there, there are these um, very, very impressive groupings. Um, and I know there are more in other parts of the world. Uh, I like to s think about this fellow in Uruguay that was the past president and had some pretty visionary ideas about how a society could be organized in a more fair way and get rid of the prisons. Well, let me again say thank you to all of you for coming out. Lan, did you want to say anything final? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I have a couple of quick things to say. Yes. You want to announce a few? Maybe I, if I could just also mention, um, there's a blue scarf on the table back there, and the young women embroider them so that it says on one side, border free, and on the other, in their language of Dari, it says, Bedune Mers, which is border free in the language of Dari. And um, so I, I said, I, I don't do retail. I'm the kid who, you know, sold more Girl Scout cookies than anybody and then lost the order form and my mother had to buy all the cookies. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> But I do do this. And so I'm, I'm selling those at $10 a piece. And um, also our friend David Smith Ferry is a wonderful poet and he's written poems about Afghanistan and Gaza. Um, I was in Gaza during the 2009 um, bombing operation Cast Lead and he took my notes and turned some of those into poems, which was very kind of him. Uh, and um, then Jackie Rive River made a wonderful video. Some of you would remember Studs Terkel. When I got out of prison um, in 2005, I think, uh, he was waiting for me with a red rose. <laughs> so anyway, he co-narrated that video with me. And um, so uh, I, I, I do need to char charge $10 for the scarf and $16 for the book. But anything else, please just take. And if you're ever in Chicago, take the business card and come by and visit us. We're just off the Argyle L station, and you'd be very, very welcome, or stay if you like. And um, uh, I do have a sign-up sheet if anybody would like to receive our newsletter. And um, I 
also would certainly be interested to welcome you if you'd ever like to take a long walk. Um, we, we do those periodically to various places, um, between various places that usually have to do with militarism and imprisonment. And um, also, if any of you would be interested in, in traveling with voices sometime, we'd be, we'd be happy to talk with you about that too. So thank you very, very much. Couple, couple quick announcements. <laughs> couple quick things before we conclude this evening. Um, again, uh, if you haven't made a donation, please consider visiting the little box over on the table and looking at the materials that Kathy had the brought and spoke about. Um, I also want to invite, I think Harry had a very quick message he wanted to, to relay to you, so we'll let him do that. Hi everyone, uh, I'll just be a moment. Uh, thank you, Kathy Kelly, for sharing your stories. Uh, it keeps the fire of, of revolution in, uh, inside of me alive, even though sometimes uh, it becomes unbearable. Um, my name's Harry Michalide. I'm a PhD student in physics at the university. Uh, some of you may know a lot of people in STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, uh, graduate and then go on to work for defense companies, defense laboratories, and I think for most of them, it's not even an issue of right or wrong. It doesn't even occur to them that uh, they're making a moral decision. Uh, I aim to change that. I'm starting a movement called STEM Boycotts the War Machine. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, and the idea is to get as many people from STEM fields, either students or workers, uh, to publicly uh, say they won't work for these companies uh, publicly and loudly and, and to organize. Um, I need a lot of help from people within science and without, uh, distributing flyers, giving statements I can quote them on, um, speaking about it wherever they can. I have some flyers here if you're interested. STEM boycotts the war machine. Thank you. I think Kathy will be around uh, for a short time this evening, uh, as we don't want to mill about. But uh, again, thank you very much for coming this evening, and uh, go out and do good work. <laughs> <laughs>